Scripture lessons this morning is from 1 Samuel 16, 10 to 13, and John 9, 1 to 7. <clears throat> Jesse had several of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to him, The Lord has not chosen these. So he asked Jesse, are there any more sons you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. So he sent and had him brought in. He was ruddy with a fine appearance and handsome features. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. So Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers. And from that day on, the Spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then went to Rahab. And from John 9, 1 through 7. <clears throat> As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he is born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus, but this happened so that the work of God might be displayed in his life. As long as it is day, we must do the work of him who sent him. Night is coming when no man can work. While I, am at, while I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Having said this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means sent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, Isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed he was. Others said, No, he only looks like him. But he, he, but he himself insisted, I am the man. Now then, were your eyes open, they demanded? Let's see if I went too far. I did. <laughs> I get carried away when I read that. So when it's a reading of God's holy word. It's all yours. Now I don't think you can go too far, Ronnie, whenever you're reading the scripture, so that's perfectly fine, right? So today we move into our fourth week on our Lenten journey towards the cross. Are you starting to feel like you can breathe again? Yeah, you're starting to feel like, hey, I've almost made it just a few more days and I can start doing what I gave up. Just a few more days and I can stop following these disciplines that I've been doing over this Lenten season. Well, I hope that is not the case. I hope that you are finding yourself growing closer to God because of how you've committed yourself to repentance and renewal during this Lenten season. You see, it's my prayer for all of you that the things that you have chosen to do and not to do during this season are bringing you to that closer relationship with God. You see, just like any other times in our lives during the season of Lent, we have the ability to choose what we do. And we have the ability to choose what we don't do as well. I think for us, the people that have grown up in a free society, we often take the ability to choose our course of action for granted. Now this Lenten season, one of the things that I have made a choice to try and follow is listening to only Christian radio uh, while I'm in the car. Now, I know that this seems like a very basic thing to choose, doesn't it? It seems like something that couldn't possibly really make any sort of change in a, in a life of a person. 
And it might seem like an odd thing for a pastor to choose as one of their Lenten disciplines. You might be thinking to yourself, well, isn't that the only type of music that a pastor ever listens to? Well, no, it is not a job requirement. I am not bound to listen to just Christian music. Um, that's not in the contract, right? Um, I don't have to do that. And you might be thinking, well, shouldn't that be the only type of music a pastor chooses to listen to? Well, maybe. But as I've said early and often, and to anyone that will listen, I am not a perfect person. And on that note, I must admit that I have had a few times where I have failed this Lenten season in listening to just Christian music. Um, I came across a George Jones CD and a Marty Robbins CD at a local thrift store, um, and I've listened to those a few times during Lent. Again, I'm not perfect. But this season, I have made the effort to listen to mostly Christian music. And what I have found is that that simple, everyday, run-of-the-mill choice that I have made has given me great joy and has brought me closer to God during this season. Listening to the words or singing alone in my car, um, choosing to use that time that I'm driving as a, just a short time of worship has been very good for my soul. I know a lot of people like to sing in the so shower, right? That's where you feel like you sound the best. Um, for me, I like to sing in the car. That's where I feel like I, I sound the best. So if you ever pass me on the road and you see my mouth going like this, chances are I'm singing. Uh, and as I said, this is not some great big grand gesture that I made for Lent. It is a small thing. It's a simple choice that I have made, but one for the most part that it's been easy to stick to. But does that mean that it is any less important? Does it mean that it is any less favorable in God's eyes? Well, no, I don't believe so. Often we find ourselves thinking that God wants big, grand things from us. We talk about giving our lives and our souls over to Christ. That's a big, grand thing, isn't it? These big sweeping ideas, they are what we are almost always what we are focusing on when we talk about Christ in our lives. But it is the small things that God uses to change our lives and our hearts. We think about those big things and those big moments that Jesus has and the impact it has on our lives, but we forget about all the little things that have led up to those big moments. When we pray, we remember to thank Jesus for going to the cross for us so that we could be free of sin. But we forget to say something as simple as, thank you, when we wake up for another day. We forget to thank him for the food that we have or the roof over our heads. These small things that we take for granted in truth are big miracles in our lives. You see, God didn't just choose the big things to change our lives or this world. He doesn't just want us to choose the big things to give to him. He can use all things for his purpose. In our scriptures for today, we find great examples of God using small things to change the world. In the first scripture from 1 Samuel, we find Samuel looking over the sons of Jesse to choose a king for the people of Israel at the uh, behest of God. Now, earlier in the scripture uh, that we didn't read today, the, the stuff that comes before where we picked up today, each of Jesse's sons goes before Samuel, and each and every time Samuel thinks to himself, okay, this must be the guy. Look, that one, he's big and strong. That's the one you want, right, God? And God tells him, no, that is not the one. And so he goes through the sons, and he finishes, and he thinks, did I come to the wrong place? Surely God has led me here. I know I'm in the right place. And so he asks, do you have any more sons? And Jesse says, well, yes, I have one more. He's the smallest, the youngest. We kept him out looking over the sheep while my other sons came in because surely you don't want the youngest and smallest of my sons to be king. And so he, Samuel says, well, bring him. And, and he does. And so David comes before him, and as uh, David passes by him, God says to Samuel, Yes, this is the one. Anoint him. This is the one that I have chosen. 
Now, what would God want with Jesse's youngest son? How could it be that this is the one? Now, sure, we're told he's ruddy and handsome, but so are the other boys. You know, I think Jesse must have thought that himself. You see, it was the smallest, though, the youngest that God was going to use to lead the people of Israel. It was the smallest, the youngest that God was going to use to defeat the giant Goliath. Because God can use the youngest and the smallest in this world to do great things. In our second scripture, we find Jesus healing a blind man. Now, this is perhaps... The strangest way that Jesus performs a miracle throughout his ministry. He spits on the ground and makes mud out of the dirt and a spit, and then he pastes it over the blind man's eyes. Tells him to go wash so that he may see again. I think we gloss over that a lot whenever we read that scripture. Because we think, hey, he is Jesus. Of course he can do something like this. But I want you to think about it this way. If you were told by your optometrist that you needed to come see me and let me spit into your eyes, and then you'd see better, would you come and do it? Or even better, he told you to come see me and I'll spit on the ground and make some mud, and I'm going to smear that mud of dirt and my spit all over your face, and then you're going to be able to see. Do you think you would be willing to do that? Well, probably not, right? Now, I know that I am not Jesus, but when you think about that blind man, he he was meeting a rabbi or a teacher, just like you would be going to a pastor. And he was meeting him, but he believed so much, and he knew that Jesus could heal him, and so he is healed. But do you think maybe just for a moment, he might have paused when he heard what Jesus was doing, right? Remember, he is blind. He doesn't see Jesus doing these things but he surely hears what's going on. Do you think he had just a moment of pause? But Jesus can use these things, these things that are not just common in the world, but things that we don't like, like spit and dirt to heal. You know, we talk about using the mundane things in this world. God can use the mundane things in this world. The root of the word mundane is mund. It comes uh, from the Greek, and believe it or not, it means dirt, mund. Um, The root of the word goes on to be mundial in our world today, which means the world. So when we talk about using mundane, we are talking about using things that are as common as dirt. See, Jesus is able to use things like that, things that are so small we don't even think about it, things that, given the choice, we'll brush out of our house on the first chance, right? We don't want to have dirt all over our homes. But God can use those things. I want to tell you a story about being chosen when I was growing up. Now, like most kids, I like to play sports at recess. And uh, when I was in the fifth grade, the big thing to play at recess was football. And where I went to school, we didn't play 11 on 11 at recess. We played like 20 on 20 uh, because we only had two footballs to share between the whole fifth grade. And so there were two football games that were held every day. There was the good players game, and then there was the rest of us players game. And one day, my friend and I decided we would try to play in the good players game. So we had always played in the other players game. Um, Our class that he and I were in, was not the class of athletic superiority. We were the academic class. And so you can imagine that the other kids didn't look too highly on us when we walked over and said, we want to play in the, this game today. And to no surprise, we were the last to pick that day. <laughs> uh, after all, we were supposed to be on that other game. We were the lowly nobodies. And I can remember that feeling of being picked last. Maybe you've had that feeling in gym class. It's not a great feeling to be the last one picked. Uh, And I can remember even the guys that were picking teams, I can remember them saying, well, I guess I'll take Eric, and you take the other guy, not like it's going to matter. Well, it turns out we did all right. We found out that though we were thought of as just as lowly and of no use, given the opportunity, we could play just fine with the good players game. 
A few years later, when we were in junior high on the football team, I started on offense, defense, and special teams, alongside those other guys that played in the good team game. And my friend who played that day, he went on to be the starting center for the high school football team for three years, as well as the class valedictorian. Not bad for two guys who were treated like they shouldn't be picked at all, right? But you see, we do that in this world. People do that in this world. We look at others and we think, I would never choose them. I would never choose that person to do anything important. But God doesn't look at any of us that way. He knows that he can use each and every one of us from the smallest to the largest, from the youngest to the oldest, and from the weakest to the strongest to do great things. How would our lives change if we began to think the same way? How would we grow closer to Jesus if we looked at the small choices that we make in our lives and decided to make the choice that we feel God would call us to? What we view as an insignificant act can make all the difference in this world. There are countless stories of people out there that were considering things like suicide and they changed their mind just because someone made a choice to be kind to them. It is in these little choices that God makes great things happen. So this week, as we continue our journey to the cross, I want you to think about all those little choices that you are making. Think about how you can give those small things to God and see how he can use them to achieve the great things. And I want you to remember this. God has already chosen you. He did so when he sent his son to save us. He chose you that day. So let's make sure we choose him every day. My challenge for you this week is this. Think small. Make the small choices right and see how God can change your world.